Hello everyone, Kasabi from Showzone here. Welcome to episode 1 of our new series, Show & Tell. If you've seen my other series, A History of the Show, on my personal channel, chances are you'll like this series too. It's about the same concept, but for shorter stories. Today I'd like to talk to you about a pitcher who only played in Major League Baseball for a few years, but some of you may fondly remember from the early years of the show. We'll begin today's episode with the concept of reading pitches. There's fast pitches, slow pitches, pitches that break, and of course you have those darn knuckleballs to sometimes worry about. Then you have different pitching styles. Slow windups, sidearm, submarine, whatever the heck Carter Caps did that one time. Different combinations of speed, angle, and pitch time can really mess with your timing at the plate. Ask around the MLB The Show community for who their least favorite pitcher to face is, and you'll get a variety of answers. The most common answers I got were Walter Johnson, Oral Hershiser, and Chris Sale. The biggest connection between these three pitchers tend to be tunneling, or in other words, how similar the pitches look during the throwing motion. Some pitchers tip off what pitch they're throwing based on their arm angle or action. In fact, there are pitchers who try and hide the ball as long as they can before bringing their arm forwards, or work with their pitching coaches to try and have their arm angle release point look as similar as possible. The reason for this is, the longer you can fool the batter by delaying any inkling of what pitch you're throwing even for just a millisecond, creates less of an opportunity for the batter to adjust their timing to swing. Of the three pitchers I just mentioned, they all have a combination of fastball, sinker, and breaking ball. Part of the success in using these pitcher cards is that there's less reaction time to discern a straight fastball from a slider. In Walter Johnson's case, it's the speed of his four-seam fastball that leaves hitters guessing. With the outlier quirk, Johnson can touch 102 miles per hour, a sinker that can break down at a slightly slower speed, and a curveball and changeup that are both in the low 80s. Hershiser also has a sinker, but it pairs with a cutter and a slider, meaning the batter could see a fastball and have it break in three different ways. Mix in another change in curve combo, and, well, five pitches that all break differently is a lot to guess on. Sale has a decently fast four-seamer, but the incredible break on his slider and circle change can buckle even the most disciplined of hitters. His sidearm angle of delivery also makes it tougher to view the break at the release point. So those were three pitchers that may not be the best in terms of their attribute score, but are still heavily used in competitive play for their finesse. We've also seen some glitchy pitchers like Vida Blue, Edinson Volquez, but nothing terribly cheesy. After all, these pitch mixes and deliveries are true to real life. Chris Sale really does pitch sideways. But there was one pitcher back in the day whose delivery and tunneling was so terribly broken, we should be thankful he never saw the light of day in online competitive play. His name? was Taylor Buckholes. I'm guessing your first reaction to that name is either who, or is he related to Clay Buckholes? And yes, he is a distant relative for those curious. Taylor Buckholes only pitched five years in the big leagues, amassing 311 innings pitched in his career. His best year in the bigs was his 2008 campaign with the Colorado Rockies. During that year, he went 6-6 six six with a 2.17 ERA and 56 strikeouts, with 66 and a third innings pitched. Or for the advanced stat connoisseurs, he had a war of 2.0 and a FIP of 3.33. Among pitchers who tallied at least 50 innings pitched that season, Buckholes was 39th in the league in FIP, which Fangraphs would give a grade between great and excellent in their scales. The best way I could really describe why Buckholes found some success in the majors was his delivery and break. There's not much video of Buckholes out there, thanks MLB Lockout. But he was mainly a ground ball pitcher, which was great for a ballpark like Coors Field. With his tall 6'4 stature, Buckholes was also able to cut precious milliseconds off a batter's reaction time by holding the ball behind his hand as long as possible. From there, his wrist would snap forward. You might see where I'm going with this. Back in 2008, the graphics on PS2 weren't as polished as they were now. The pitching motion with the ball hiding behind Buckholes' hand, plus the over-the-top pitching motion, made it insanely hard for the batter to read. As a side note, Buckholes' delivery in the game was listed as Brandon Backey, who was a pitcher for the Houston Astros at the time. Houston fans may fondly remember Backey's 8-shutout inning performance in Game 5 of the 2004 NLCS, but other than that, Backey wasn't much of a viable pitcher in MLB The Show. He had a career ERA of over 5, and a whip of 1.54. Buckholes, meanwhile, was one of the top-rated relievers back in MLB 09 The Show. His attribute score was good enough for the 15th best relief pitcher in the game. If you were doing a fantasy draft or playing an exhibition against a friend, chances are you came across Buckholes based on his rating. Bring him into a game and you'd find that his delivery was one of the most OP mechanics you'd ever feast your eyes upon. Buckholes' arsenal was a four-seam fastball, a 12-6 curve, a slider, 
and a circle change. His fastball only touched 94 miles per hour, but the break on his 12-6 curve was maxed. Couple that with a side-breaking slider, and the pitching tunneling made him hard to read. Plus, if you pitched in the Rockies' home white uniforms, the pixels blended with the ball, and Buckles was downright unfair to bat against. I also had to do some research, since there's also the fact that swing timings were insanely fast a decade ago. Using Justin Verlander's fastball as a base from each game, we can see just how different the time is from the ball releasing in the pitcher's hand to hitting against the catcher's glove. As you can see here, I've timed the release point for a Justin Verlander fastball right down the middle, and both points are right as the ball is about to come out of his hand. Once the ball pops in the catcher's glove on the pitch, we can determine how many frames it took. At a frame rate of 60 frames per second, the PS2 Verlander's motion takes 29 frames for a 95 mile an hour fastball. Meanwhile, the PlayStation 5 Verlander takes 35 for a 94 mile per hour fastball. It's not exact with the slight miles per hour difference, but then again, I don't really think 1 mile per hour would make 6 frames of difference. As far as the timing goes, you absolutely needed to be faster on the PS2. Regarding Buckholes, keep that number of frames in mind. He also has a mid-90s fastball. While you can somewhat see the ball through his pitching motion, Buckholes' ball release point is first seen at this point here, and then hits the catcher's glove 30 frames later. However, considering the angle of release plus the blending with Buckholes' jersey, the ball is lost around frame 14 and doesn't come back into vision until around, I would say, frame 23. That leaves 7 frames for the batter to realistically make up his mind on what type of pitch is coming, and whether or not to swing. To put that into perspective, the standard blink of an eye is 8 frames. Meaning, if you blinked starting at the 23 frame mark, by the time your eyes are back set, the ball is already in the catcher's glove. There's even more of a difference when the ball is hidden in a white uniform. This upcoming pitch also has a duration of 30 frames. You quite literally cannot see the ball from the beginning of the release from the hand until the 20 frame mark, if you're even able to pick it up then. That's two thirds of the frames already lost. From there, most batters would first see the ball at frame 23 again, meaning the batter has to decide which kind of pitch they're looking at as well as make a decision to swing in seven frames. Comparing to PS2 Verlander's pitch again, the first 19 frames of the motion can be seen, before the ball is somewhat lost in the jersey for about 4 frames until frame 23. At this point, you have the same amount of time to swing as the Buckholes pitch, but those extra 19 frames to begin with the ball coming out of the hand tell you a lot. With Verlander's pitching, you could read a fastball a lot easier with 4 lost frames than a Buckholes pitch where 9 or 10 of those frames are completely lost. There was a bit of solace to be found once you got a base runner on and forced Buckholes into the stretch, but even then the ball could be seen briefly, then disappear for a good while in the release motion. Again, this pitch from the stretch is 30 frames long, and we can see the ball fine for the first 13 or 14 frames. Thankfully, the ball comes back into view at frame number 20, so you have a few extra frames to decide on swinging. There were no game patches back then, and you really couldn't fault other players for using one of the best rated relief pitchers in the game. Taylor Buckholes won't be remembered for being as broken as somebody like Bo Jackson or Michael Vick. It's hard to say if many baseball fans remember him as a pitcher at all. I mean... There are no clips of this guy on YouTube. I'd search, believe me. But we can all probably agree that facing a pitching delivery like his in the modern gaming era would probably have some competitive players calling for blood. Thank goodness the delivery never made it to online play. Thanks for watching this edition of Show and Tell. For more MLB The Show content, please consider subscribing. More new content is on the way soon, but until next time, this is Kasabi from Showzone.